morning. Uh, we have a couple of minutes. Uh, I just want to say, uh, repeat, this is a beginner level talk. There is a lot of stuff that I have not included. Just so you know, we can cover the concepts uh, you know, in an easy to uh, learn manner or something. Uh, there are not 10 steps, uh, like less than 10 steps to do this. Uh, focus on what I am talking about in terms of the principles. Okay? Because there are so many different distros, there are so many different ways of doing this. But the principles remain the same. And try to see you know, how it's applicable to your situation. So we can do the QA in between. Just raise your hand, uh, you know, I'll repeat the question for the camera so that we have a total 40 minutes for the, uh, the talk and the QA. Right? And uh, the principles are more important. You can easily figure out how to go about doing it in the end. I'll also be giving you, uh, when I publish the slides uh, on the uh, funnel page, I'll also be giving you a simple PDF. So if you want to just follow the steps, you know what I've done, and you can use that like a workbook and add your own steps. Fine? Please feel free to ask questions, it's pretty formal. Let me know. Okay, cool. So my name is Akash. Uh, I'll be talking about securing a Linux web server in 10 steps or less. When I say a Linux web server, I mean a Linux server, Linux distribution. I'm talking about Ubuntu 10.04 uh, LTS, uh, running a web server, running a database server, and running SSH. Okay, these are the basic things that you do for a lab stack, or even if you want to do something with Python or you know with your Django or your Ruby or something, you have these things in place. You have the web server. If you are, you know, if you prefer Nginx, Lighty, I don't know, but the principles remain the same. I'm talking about Apache, I'm talking about MySQL, and I'm talking about OpenSSL. Right? So, my first slide. Can anyone name this aircraft? What, what, what? It's stealth, yes, but the Blackbird was never stealth. It was just too fast. It was like Mac 3 plus SR 71. Yeah, yeah. Someone said 117. Yeah, that's what it is. It is F 117 Nighthawk. This is the fir first stealth aircraft the world had. It was operational for uh, some 20 odd years. And after being commissioned by the, American, the US Air Force in 82, for 16 years, they did not even acknowledge that this thing existed. So, and you know they are based in this uh, state of Nevada, in the in the U.S. And uh, you know about Area 51 and all the alien sightings or the UFOs or whatever. It's possible people are looking at this. Okay, why is this here? Reduce attack surface. That's the principle. That's the security principle I'm talking about. How does this do it? Uh, there was a brilliant Russian physicist who figured out that the radar. <coughs> does not rely on how heavy or how big an object is. It's like sending something, getting something back. But it is relying on how many edges, straight edges that object has, the flying object. Okay, so uh, Lockheed, which is a big defense contractor in the US, they have this uh, group called the Skunk Works, which is like, you know, they, they do the black projects, the top secret or the ultra top secret or whatever. And in the 70s, they figured out they had the material, they had the computational you know, uh, capability to programmatically figure out what kind of radar signature something, you know, a flying machine like this would have. Okay. And uh, this one, this, this one of those planes, it is meant for stealth. So it's not as fast as the other planes available. A fast plane means that it has something called the afterburner in the engines and they give off a distinct heat signature. Okay, so this is purely meant as stealth by reducing the attack surface. So if you go to uh, Wikipedia, you can see different pictures and it just does not look like any other normal plane that you'll see. The next evolution of this is something called the B2 Spirit, which is a bomber from them and that's still in uh, you know operation. And uh, it, it looks even weirder than this. Okay, so what I mean by reduced attack signature or surface in Linux? What is the attack surface when you talk about a Linux server? The first attack surface, or the first point of attack surface is all the TCP and UDP ports listening on the external interfaces. 
the external facing IP addresses. The IP address someone can use to reach your machine. Be it a DNS, you know, to the resolution with an A record or, or someone doing an NMAP scan or whatever it is. Okay, how would you do that? The first thing to do is, what is visible? This is the command. You need to be root. Okay, it will tell you the process, otherwise it will not tell you the process. Whenever it says hash, like you know, this is an internal joke in rootconf. The three hashes mean, you know, it's the root prompt. Uh, next stack, space minus NLTUP. This will tell you, N stands for do not resolve. So it will tell you the exact IP, it will not tell you the host name. It will tell you the port number, it will not tell you the service name. L means for listening, T is for TCP, U is for UDP, and P is what process spawned that, you know, what is the process listening for that port. Right? So if you want to kill it or something, you can figure it out. What? Yeah, but this is only meant for ports listening on external interfaces. Obviously, it will show for internal interfaces, but uh, if it says 127.0.0.1, that's local host. If it says 0, 0.0 or in the you know uh, T, uh, yeah, IPv6 format, 0 colon colon something, that means it's listening on all ports. Okay, this is basically telling you this is my Linux server on the external interface. Someone can reach this port number. Okay, so now the question is, how do we reduce this? This is the attack surface. This will give you a list of things. So how do you reduce this? So there are a couple of ways. One is by stopping services from running. Okay, this is Ubuntu, so. Uh, now you can use the service command as well, but the standard way of Debian Ubuntu was to use slash etc slash init.d, whatever the service name is, and stop. You can say start or you can say restart, or if you give some wrong thing here, uh, parameter here will tell you what are the options which are valid. Okay, so you already have a server, this, uh, you know, once you figure out that uh, there are a bunch of ports open, you know, these services are listening on the external interface. What you need to do is, this is how you stop them. You can also make sure that if the server boots, those services are removed using the update rc.d command. Okay? It's, uh, there are a bunch of options. The simplest is if you give the service name and you say remove, it will not start at boot time. It won't be available in the run, you know, run time, run level 0, 1, 2, 3, whatever. Not 0, 0 is like starting. Okay, and you can do one thing. This is specially recommended for MySQL. If your web server and the MySQL database server are on the same host, MySQL doesn't need to listen to the on the external IP, right? Because that connection can be a local. It can be a TCP connection. You don't want to do IPC. That's fine. But it can be a local host connection. Your web server will still be able to find that, right? So this is something that you can add. Now this, this is true for uh, Apache as well, your web server as well. There is a place where you specify which IP to listen on, which interface to listen on. By default it, it's usually given as all. So then you can do, you know, if you're on the uh, machine itself, you can do a local host. Uh, in your browser you'll reach the web page or you can give the actual IP. You'll, you'll give uh, whatever the IPs your machine has, it will still reach the web page. Okay, so in case you have a, a, a proxy or you know you are like running nginx or something else in the front end and Apache is meant for something else or maybe you are run, running mongrel or whatever, you know one of these application type of servers. If they don't need to be available on the internet, they should be list, you know running on this. Okay, make sense? This is what it should look like. For our reference implementation where we are talking about MySQL database listening on the localhost interface, your Apache web server on uh, port 80, I have not taken uh, you know the SSL part of it and SSH running on port 22, right? This is good enough for you to serve any kind of LAN pages, right? All your PHP will work. You have a database, you have the web server with mod PHP and you can copy files over SSH. If you're wondering why there is no port 21, you should not be using FTP for copying. Any tool you use to copy files over FTP, the same tool can be used to copy files over SSH or SCP. 
Okay. The other part of attack surface. Mostly, when what we do, like if you're in the cloud or we have a VPS, we have to rely on the the distro or the kernel already available to us, right? In case we have the advantage, we have you know we can set up our own, or you're setting up a virtual machine or you're setting up a machine which you will be migrating to the uh, cloud. Start with a mini ISO. Okay, this is when they release a standard Ubuntu release or a Debian release, they also come up with this mini ISO. This is just enough to set up your networking and set up your base system and give you a shell. Okay, obviously then you have to do a little more work. But this definitely means none of the extra things are on this. Right, this is another way of reducing the attack surface. I'm not going to go into like how this can be attacked, but it will be. So you can install SSH, which you will need definitely, you know, later. You can install your required, you know, LAMP packages using a command called task cell. All you have to say task cell space LAMP hyphen server and it will install it. There are a bunch of options. If you want to install a desk, Ubuntu desktop uh, with uh, GNOME or, uh, you know, with uh, KDE or with, there are a couple of others, right? Whatever. So, yeah, there's another one with L. Platform. X, X, well, what is, I'm using that currently. XFC. Yeah, XFC. Sorry. X Ubuntu. Yeah, so there's an uh, option for that as well. There are no compilers, extra libraries, nothing is there. How is it a good thing? First of all, it takes less space. So, you know, it copying it, uh, taking snapshots, uh, uh, you know, creating it again will be easy. Uh, the other thing is, if you really want the compilers or whatever, you can start with a package called Build Essentials. That will install your uh, uh, C compiler and all that. Okay, this is another way of reducing the attack surface. This may be relevant when you have uh, a lot of users who will be, you know, accessing your uh, system. They will have SSH access. They'll be able to execute processes, <coughs> even though non-privileged processes. But let's say you have not updated your kernel, you have not patched it recently and there is a local exploit available okay something that will allow them to elevate their privilege or something you can avoid that because there's no compiler whatever they'll first have to install that or they'll have to figure something out patches and updates this is very important uh, i don't need to tell you it, uh, ubuntu and debian i mean most linux distributions make it very very simple to update and patch the only thing you have to worry about is will it break my production server and you know that's something that you can figure out but it's really important my recommendation choose a long term support release an LPS when you are using Ubuntu ok for Debian they usually say use stable for RHEL oh, nobody will pay money for that but if you are using CentOS they uh, say that you know now you should move to maybe 6 because uh, in 2014, uh, CentOS 5 dot whatever X uh, version is, it's running out of support. But 6 will be supported for the next 10 years. Okay, Whatever you choose, choose something which has long term support. The whole point of setting up a server is that you should not have to spend too much time maintaining it. Unless you are know, you know, you're into tinkering or whatever. Okay, That's a different use case. In Ubuntu, is a very simple command to update in patch. Okay, This is it. Your root, you do apt get update and apt get upgrade. When you do an upgrade, if there is something available, there are packages to be downloaded, it will ask you, do you want to download that? You can uh, avoid that by giving a minus Y. The only reason I have not mentioned it is that it's a good practice to see what is going to get updated. Okay. Uh, there is another thing that if you don't, you know, your, your server is so critical, there should be no downtime. There is this uh, uh, tool called VM Slice or VM, VM Slice, something like that, which will upgrade your kernel without requiring a restart. No, KM oh yeah, KM Slice. Sorry. So you know, it will upgrade your kernel without requiring a restart. The only time a Linux server needs to be restarted. Uh, but for production use or for commercial use, you have to pay money. If you are using it at home, there is no money to be paid. It's like some three dollars per server per month or something. Okay, protecting your access. This is my own cat picture with the cat doors always open. 
the point of this picture is that a server which is functional, which is solving some purpose, will have some kind of access open. Okay, you can't have a server where there are no files need to be copied, nothing needs to be updated, logs need not be you know taken out. So access is going to be there. So what are we going to do about it? Okay, now the paranoid folks, what they will do, they will not have uh, what access is you know apparent. Like I am saying that your SSH is running on TCP port 22, but they will have something called port knocking, or they'll have a you know single web page which they have access of. That if you access that web page, which will have some random streams or something, then SSH will start listening, and then you can log in. Okay, I am not going into that. I am just trying to make it very simple. In the simplest form, you are going to have SSH access. You need to protect it. Okay, so what do we do? The number one reason I think for hacked Linux servers, a, a hacked Linux server is worth a lot of money. For the simple reason, you have all these tools, you can you know script a lot of things, and these tend to keep running. They don't need to be restarted or you know reinstalled or whatever. Okay. The number one reason is SSH server password brute forcing. What is that? It simply means that you have user accounts, you have root, you have some standard user accounts. Uh, you know, uh, in some companies, it's it's a tradition to have the username as the same name as company name or the project name. You know, project name might have uh, uh, a, a proper name and a nickname. So user accounts tend to look at that, or there could be a user like backup or uh, you know developer. There are standard user accounts that people use, and they can, these can be brute force. Brute force simply means that someone is going to keep trying different password uh, combinations till they figure out. Now why does this work? Because we suck at keeping good passwords. Our passwords tend to be like, you know, six characters, five characters, only alphabets, lowercase, things like that. Okay, like, I'm not going to, get, going to get into that, but consider that this is the number one hack, you know, reason for hacking Linux servers. But we need SSH access, so what do we do? In the simplest terms. So the conventional wisdom says, if you try to read, if you uh, Google for securing SSH, securing Linux server, this is what you will find. Okay, this is all good, needs to be done. Don't allow root to log in. You know, there's an option for that in uh, SSHD. Don't use passwords, use keys, which is again a good thing. Your uh, by default, if you launch a EC2 instance in Amazon, there's no password access at all. You have to generate a key pair and then you have to use that. Okay, a .pem file or if you're using putty, you have to like import it, then save it uh, as the public, private and, and use that. Only use SSH version 2.0. Uh, some of the old uh, Cisco routers, even now don't have this. They're still, you know, because to pay for the upgrade for the OS on the Cisco router, it's very expensive. So there is some SSH version uh, one point whatever, and it has some standard attacks. Okay, so this is the conventional wisdom. This is what you will find there. Additionally, this is what the problem is. Password brute forcing requires valid users. A valid password can only exist for a valid user. Okay, lots of people use keys without passphrases. Now it's a good thing to use a key, but then someone has to steal that key. I don't know how many of you know, uh, recently Yahoo released a extension for a browser, I think for Chrome, and they in, they had embedded the, the private key in that, and then they had to like revoke it or something. Okay, uh, a lot of people, are, you know, if someone is targeting you, they will try to steal your keys, private keys, and once the key is gone, it's gone. Because a lot of people don't keep pass, passphrases. It's like they think that if there's a key, you know, Nobody knows the password, I have the key. But the key can be lost, stolen, you know, something like that. One additional change you should make in your ETC SSD config is to have, uh, you know, use this directive called allow users. It's a simple option. Here, you can specify either the username or if you have the, you know, uh, advantage of a static uh, ID for your internet presence, specify it with the, that static IP. Which will mean is, it's not that you know your uh, people will still not try to brute force your uh, the password, 
but they'll not be successful because this user from this IP only that is allowed to access your SSH. Okay. Now, I personally use this. I have a VPS somewhere, which is one of the cheap VPS, like some six dollars a month or something, and that that I use only for the static IP I get. Right, and all my servers where I am uh, managing for my clients or whatever, from that IP certain users are allowed access. Which means if my home system is hacked or whatever, there is still some kind of protection. But it also means if the VPS goes down and they change they change their IP, then I'm screwed basically. But you know that that it's up to you. But this is something most people do not tend to mention. They allow users which is already available with SSH, and uh, you should start using this. Okay. The other thing that if you are if you believe that you know you can have some obscurity, you know keep a random user, not have an English word. Take a Hindi word and you know put it in uh, English. Call it like adhyapak or I don't know what is the word for manager. What's the Hindi word for manager? Prabandak. Yeah, because most of the people who are trying to brute force, they have these dictionaries which are for English words. Right. So till you know we have uh, hackers from the Hindi heartland, you are safe. Okay. The most important part. How much time do I have? Half an hour. Oh, good. Cool. Okay, I'm gonna finish early. So the most important part. I was not. I was not. Really, you know, I was not sure if I should add this slide, but I realized if I'm gonna explain the rest of the uh, uh, talk to you, this is important. A lot of people are not very clear about how permissions are derived, or what you know certain permissions mean. Okay, so we'll do a simple exercise. What I've given here is uh, you, have, you have your read, you have your write, and execute. That's the standard thing, and you have user, group, and others. U G O R W X, right? So it maps to how you give permissions for files and folders in Linux. Okay, and if you need to figure out. What this is? This simply means this is not a directory. The user, the first three belong to user, has read, write, and execute, which corresponds to seven. If you use octal, a lot of people give that, right? You know, you might have uh, ranted about developers giving seven, 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 and that being a problem. Why is that a problem? You see that? Okay. So for the group, you have read and execute. So if you are part of the same group, you can, you know, at least. CHDIR to that directory, and you can read. So you can see what files are there, but you can't make changes. And others have read. You may not. You don't have to give this, but I'm just trying to do that. So R W X for user, R minus X for group, and R minus minus for others. So this and this is same. Okay. Now, anyone has any questions about this? Because my the next part depends on this. People are saying this. You don't get it. You don't have questions. <laughs> so this is a typical uh, thing I see in Bangalore. Okay, uh, different people from different parts of India have different ways of nodding. This is a yes. This is a yes. This is a yes. <laughs> or a no, or maybe. So it's getting interesting. Okay. So everyone gets it. Good. Before we go to that, in Ubuntu uh, or Debian, this is something that you should do. I don't know if it really helps it, but this is a uh, this is like recommended by everyone. So maybe you can uh, look at it. In etc. Apache do con dot d security. These two lines are line number twenty seven and thirty nine, which is server tokens and server signature. They are commented. You can uncomment these. So if I have to find out, you know, what your website is running, and I'm not trying to, I don't want to run a tool or something. Whatever your domain name is, after that I'll give a one. Or I'll give some name which I know that file does not exist. If you are not having, if you don't have a custom 404 error page below, it will tell me exactly what this is running, what mod uh, uh, proxy, and you know you have that fast CGI or whatever, whatever, whatever. Right? Now, does it really help the attacker or does it thwart the attacker? No. But why make it easy? It's as simple as that. And there's no there's no cost of just uncommenting two lines, okay? So if you're running Apache, you should uncomment these two. For MySQL, 
I am repeating this. If database and web server are on the same host, on the same computer, then MySQL server should only listen on localhost. There is no need for it to listen on anything else. I don't think there is any performance benefit either ways. There is nothing else. Okay. So in your etc mysql my.cnf, my.cnf is used when you use the, the standard mysql configuration which is meant for like medium sites. There is a, a keyword called bind hyphen address. Uh, as far as Ubuntu goes, I think this is default uh, value. But then I have seen some instances on Amazon where this is not the default value. Okay, so this is something that you can check. As part of your checklist, you can have that. It's listening on this only if your database server and the web server are on the same machine. Okay, then you have to give the the external accessible IP. Otherwise, your uh, PHP script or whatever your web server has to read the database, they need to know which machine to go to. But I'll I'll tell you how to protect that. The next thing to do, this is a script provided by default it's you know installed when you have when you install mysql server you should run this so it will do three distinct things okay one is if you don't have a root user password it will make sure that you set a root user password the root user of the mysql server okay not your system root mysql server the database server it's a server it has uh, users so the root user of that it will set up the other thing is it will remove the test database. The test database is if there was a blank user and MySQL basically ships to the blank user where you don't put anything if you just you know uh, say MySQL you have access to the te test database. It will remove the test database and it will also remove the blank user. It might also ask you to not uh, only allow root user access if you are on the same machine but I am not sure of that. Okay. The other thing to do is when you create a new database, you should always create a different user. In some cases, I've seen the same user being used. The chances of the credentials getting leaked or something are higher. Or if one site, you know, you have one website, you have virtual host or whatever, and one website the credentials are gone, then you have to go manually change it everywhere else. So if you have 10 websites or 10 places, you have to go change the password. It just makes more sense to have one user for one database. And also, do not uh, you know, give grant privileges or any kind of privileges. Using, uh, if there is a problem with your application, there are ways of writing to an out file. You know, if you have uh, execute, in, you know, enabled in the privileges, and that only works, it will route right to the out file, then you know whatever the attacker will do, will do. For your standard websites, I don't think there is need for anything apart from these six things. Select, update, insert, delete, or, you know, alter and create. You agree? Not agree? The other thing is the user, when you create a new user, you should always specify, you know, where the user can log in from. Having the database locally ensures that obviously you know someone from outside will not be able to log in, but at the same time, just specify this. You can specify a percentage, which means that any host. Don't use that. Either have it local host, specify local host, or specify the exact IP, you know, where the MySQL connection will be made from, right? If your database is on a different uh, host. Okay, don't give percentage. That's just lazy. Okay, and it doesn't help you because come to think of it, whatever your application does, most of it, the, the core part, the you know the main part of your uh, application is about the database. Your application is you know uh, processing stuff and putting in database. So there is some what do you call it, the the intellectual property or whatever you want to call it is in the database. Okay, and we tend to be very lax about that. Because the defaults work and our website looks, you know, it works properly. We don't tend to think about that. The other thing to do is to use the Ubuntu uncomplicated firewall. This is not a new firewall. This is just an interface to 
the same thing that IP tables does. Okay, if you've seen IP tables format, I mean, I don't. If there are like complicated rules, I don't understand it. There are like your uh, NAT tables and the forward and accept, and there are a bunch of these keywords. Every time I have to configure that, I have to go in the house. Okay, and the problem with any kind of security configuration is if it is difficult to understand, it is difficult to train everyone at the same level. It is difficult to assure that everyone will be able to configure it properly. Okay, so Ubuntu comes with this really nice thing called the UWF. It's called the Uncomplicated Firewall, like the name. Very simple, just do it enabled, and then you allow the ports you want to allow. Now, if you see, it's 2280 443 if you want. Okay, now there is no need to allow 3306 if your database server is on the same machine. Right? And then you default deny. After you allowed what you had to allow, you didn't deny. So it will make sure that nothing else is connecting. Does that make sense? Okay. It will create the uh, uh, resultant IP table format. So if you want, you can go customize that. But this is just an interface for that. So you know it makes it easier for us to understand. Like reading this rule set is far easier than sometime when we see. And it will it will follow the best practices. Like it will do the established well, I think that if the connection is allowed or whatever, you know, if it's established, they'll allow it and all that. Yes, once this is set, you can use the UFW status. It will show you this format. If you do IP tables minus L. Capital L will show you that format. It's up to you. You can mix and match. Yeah, it's it's basically a wrapper. Yeah, that, that's a better way than interface. So if you need to, and I mean I've had uh, people because database sometimes you know they want to have like a, a separate machine and everything for backup for security or whatever. You can do this. You have to you have to allow from external DB IP to the current host IP. This is the public IP address of the uh, machine where your firewall your rules are going to be, port 3306. That's it. So in case you still had to do it, first you made sure that the user you created inside the MySQL server, right, that could only log in from that external DVIP. And now you have enabled that in the firewall. You have poked the hole so that you know your access is available. This is the port for MySQL. So even in if it's local host, it's listening on 3306. If you have enabled TCP IP, otherwise it could be a socket based connection also. But uh, I don't know, uh, I have never used socket. I personally disabled that. It's actually better password. If you're doing listening on 127001, you listen on a UAP socket. It's faster. Yeah. So it does IPC. Right, directly to the file server, so no more PCB transfer. That, that's faster. Okay, I don't know. But I mean, how much of a difference will it make? Slight. Slight. What is slight length? Microseconds. Depends on how much data, like, that's the matter. So if you can do IPC, do IPC. But that will be like, uh, not everything can write to the socket. It has to be some privileged process. Yes. Or only MySQL can write to it. So then the standard file no, permissions. MySQL, MySQL, your application is writing. MySQL is listening on the uh, on your Unix socket, and your application, whichever is the front end. But that's only because it has a MySQL driver to connect to that socket. Because I mean, the question is, how do you protect write and uh, read access to that the socket? Well, that'll be some standard file permissions. Okay, so uh, some kind of a reference web app architecture. Please feel free to follow it. Please feel free to discard it. This is what I think you know a basic uh, web application will look like. The document root. This is your web server document root. What if whatever is inside this directory will get served. Okay. So if you make a mistake, if you do you know uh, db config dot php dot back, your web server is going to serve that as a uh, text file. Because uh, you know it's like uh, it's inside the document. Only. So 
document should root should only contain files that are meant to be served to the user now i'm sure there are many 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 exceptions to this rule where you have to put it inside that like in dotnet asp.net you have a web.config which is which has to be part of the document rule but then the web server takes care that that is never served like apache by default will not serve any file which starts with dot ht you can rename uh, you know you can set up a file for dot ht1 it doesn't have to be dot ht access apache will refuse to serve it because by default in the http config itself that that is uh, given now everything which is required for your web application but doesn't need to be served to the user can be outside the document rule because all all the you know the web server needs is read access to that file the user the browser you know people accessing from the uh, user agent don't need to do anything about it so maybe this is how what you can do you have your website running in site folder var www public is whatever all the files that you will be serving index.php or whatever it is you know your blog.php comment.php and then you have a private folder which is obviously your, so your document root is this var www site public so that's your document root and those will get served your db config other things can be in private now as long as this group which is what the web server is running as the process apache web server running is running as www hyphen data this group has read access to this folder right they'll be able to read the file now if you need uploads you know uploads tend to be uh most use cases is you up, uh, up get uploads for uh, picture of the you know profile or or media or something now tend people tend to think that it has to be inside document root if you are not going to serve that same uh, you know whatever is getting uploaded then it can be outside but if you are going to use the same images or something then obviously it has to be here but only that folder should have right access for the group does that make sense so what you do is you you use ssh with your user your user is, is called foo and you copied the files okay now the user or the owner of those files is user foo now that foo user or those files can have the group as ww hyphen data those files and folders and then based on the permission set the web web server will be able to write to it read from it execute you know go inside that directory you don't need to set others to 777 that only happens when your files and folders the owner is someone else and they are not part of this group right so then you will not give others access to execute and write which is a big no no because it leads to other things so finally what we did and this is definitely less than 10 steps is uh, start from a mini iso uh, you know ideal case and you remove the unwanted services to reduce your attack surface then you whitelist user for ssh login only that user from that ip or only that user can uh, login the mysql user has been protected right because you have set it that this user from this ip or this host is allowed to access this database and you're not using standard root user and you have a default deny in your firewall and you have allowed certain whatever you wanted you know whatever services remain after you have removed the unwanted services you have port 22 for ssh so you have you can uh, do your files uh, your your shell and file access then you have your web server and uh, database and you keep that so that's like what five on what okay his question is uh, what's your name some of his question is can you uh, restrict access based on a user agent to the content you can try but you do do need to understand the user agent uh, string is coming from outside your server so if someone changes that it's a okay 
ओके सो नो द द ओनली प्रॉब्लम देन इज यू कैन डू इट लाइक मे बी द डिफॉल्ट डब्ल्यूकेट यूजर एजेंट आई नो एल बी लिप पर्ल वट एवर विच वन इट इज दैट दैट इज ब्लॉक राइट एंड दैट यू कैन डू एट एट द वेब सर्वर लेवल बट इफ समन चेंजेस इट देन यू वुड नो and it's very easy to change the user agent because it's part of the http uh, header right so okay so uh, i used to think that's a good idea but there are two problems with that first of all if you rely on some uh, uh, you know tools for automated deployments or whatever everywhere you have to specify the port okay so whatever it is eventually it has to connect to some port the tcp ip connection has to go somewhere right so it has to connect to some port which the server is listening on if it's not listening on 22 it can't go through to right so you could do that now the problem is what i have read and i think you know kingsley might be a better person to answer this question is uh, if you listen on a high port above 1023 then any non privileged user can also listen you know create a process which listens on that port okay now i was trying to find some references where this has been a problem in the real world i was not able to but i don't know have you seen that would you recommend that running it on non standard port Why not? See, basically, port scan is one technique. Okay, basically, what you're doing is, if I figure out what port responds on your IP, I can send enough data for it to reply. And SSH by default expects some kind of a cert certification type of message to go through, or at least you know what. Uh, uh, cryptography will support and all that. It will reply with some error. Yeah, I will tell you. Open SSH version and all that, right? So, if if the idea is that your bot should not fill up your logs, right? That's the only thing it is going to protect you. The automated attacks will happen. Twenty two is not responding. It's not that the bot will stop, but your logs will not get filled up. Your auth dot log. But does that really help you with anything else? I'm not sure. but if you whitelist the user then you are assured that if the your uh, you know password is very basic but they can't figure out what the username was they never be able to log in okay but again what you uh, say might make sense but i wouldn't do it on a machine where a lot of other users who i don't know personally had uh, shell access and uh no in, in the sense like uh, you can't stop someone from running a process which listens on a tcp port after 1023 from 1 1 to 1023 is for privileged user for root right anything above is anything else right so if you run like some people run it on 2222 uh, see if if my default ssh is running on a higher port what is the problem the user who gets it okay i I'll, i'll give you a scenario for some reason your ssh stops working okay so you get a message and someone starts their rogue ssh okay that's the only uh, example i've uh, gotten so far but what you're doing is you're bypassing as long as you keep it and uh, so another good suggestion if you don't want to run on 22 you see what are the other uh, services you know up till 1023 and you run it on that the pain is that then every client that you use to connect you to ssh you will have to specify that port number Yeah, run it on twenty two with the whitelisted user. That's what I would recommend. That's how I run it. So, because as such, you don't need to give access to every. You can't even have a single user. No, it's just that uh, depends on how you keep your password. Also, right? If your password is simple, 
और देर वॉज दिस सिक्योरिटी कंपनी कॉल्ड They used to run this website called rootkit root rootkits dot com. Okay, that person has written a book also. So obviously, he definitely knows a lot about security. But uh, his admin received a mail which seemed to be from him, saying that I am in uh, some conference in the Middle East. I need to access. I have forgotten the SSH password. Can you send it to me? Can you set, reset and send it to me? That pa- person did that, and then you know there were some twenty-eight thousand emails. <laughs> No, this is before and onwards. This was called the anti-security, anti-sec. These were a bunch of hackers from Saudi Arabia and all that, who were just pissed off with everyone in the world. So, this is before your and onwards and all that. But when you whitelist and you have a, you have a good password or you have a passphrase in public key, private key, that gives you more assurance, right? And I, I that's what I would uh, suggest. Oh, there's another thing. what i have not covered what you should think of you should be looking at your logs maybe you know uh, there are a bunch of uh, tools people are talking about uh, there's a talk on what is that ganglia or something then nagios this log watcher whatever is suitable for you there was a talk on that you should be monitoring them like at least uh, if your server goes down your ssh goes down or something happens you should get a, some kind of an alert you might do something with it might not do something with it but uh, depending on you know how much money you spend on your production system monitoring some people pay a lot of money or you can use a simple tool which will you know there is a monitors website monitor.us or something which will just tell you if your port is down okay and uh, and additionally you should be thinking of whitelisting in host.allow or this should be host or deny sorry made a mistake so uh this is just a this is called a tcp wrapper you can specify the service and you know which ip or subnet or you know network with a wild card is allowed to access so if you use something like uh, fail to ban or deny hosts which is another protection for against brute forcing that if there is some you know uh, x number of connections in some time duration which are all failing for your ssh access then that ip is put in host dot deny okay my problem with that is for some reason if your ip gets banned then what do you do and i've seen that happen because there was like one developer working and then he was out of the office so he the other person who was supposed to work on it called him to get the password did not want to send a text me- message now this developer told him the password over the phone but there was some miscommunication so he kept trying kept trying and then they got banned so then they had to call their support to uh, reset the password it happens you know it's funny when it happens to other people but it does happen so i don't really recommend the banning uh, strategy just like that apart from this that's it that's all i have yeah you can uh, your question is can i den- uh, ban uh, for ssh based on country Yes, you can do that. Uh, you can specify an entire IP block. So, if you are thinking of banning uh, users from uh, China or Russia or whatever, you can. Uh, 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 there is a really cool tool uh, called Block Finder. It's in, on GitHub. You put in the two-letter country code. It will tell you all the IP blocks from that country. You can put that in your configuration. That's all you need to do. you know the problem with that is it's possible that the person uh, who's actually trying to monitor might be sitting in the next house they might be just going through china so you can start blocking but it's like a never ending slope at one point you will have blocked everyone but yourself but yes you can do that any other questions question yeah is that a question or your opinion okay his opinion is that absolute security is a myth the it's more like a i think it's an economics problem it it depends on the time you have and the money you have and the paranoia you have anything else i have a question that if you add your past life or 
Okay. Okay, uh, I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you so much.